Well, let's, uh, let's take our Bibles together, shall we? Turn to the Gospel of John. I invite you to turn to our passage for this morning. John chapter 7, verses 40 through 52. If you use the church Bible, you're going to find that on page uh, 893. It's John chapter 7, verses 40 through 52. Actually, I'm going to begin reading, even though the focus of our exposition this morning is uh, verses 40 through 52. I'm going to start in verse 37, just for, uh, for the sake of context. So I invite you to follow along and listen to God's word as it is read. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were about to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to him, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. This is God's word. I trust that you are grateful to be able to have such easy access to it. Would you join me, please, in a prayer of preparation? Our Father, our prayer is that you would open our eyes, that we may see wonderful things in your word, We want you to light our paths. We we want you to teach us your ways. And we pray that you would unite our hearts to fear your name. Lord, I need your help. I need your help to speak only what is helpful for your people. We all need your help to have hearts that are ready to hear what you have to say to us. So Lord, would you do that? Would you do that even now? And while the voice of a mere man cannot accomplish anything of eternal or lasting value, the voice of your spirit applying this word to our lives can. And we pray that it would happen even now. And this all for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is uh, great to be back with you. We had a nice time away, but it's always so very, very refreshing to come back home to our home church. Uh, One of the things that's great that that we have, and so thank you for those who keep the website, I like that we get to have the, the sermons recorded, and in fact, some of the Sunday school classes. And so I listened. I listened to Aaron, and I listened to Josh, both of them bringing the word and the uh, the sermon. I was also able to listen to the marriage Sunday school class that was taught by James, so I was grateful for that. Thank you guys for your faithfulness in preaching and teaching the Word of God. I was, I was very much edified by those, uh, those teachings and preachings. But beyond the Word of God, in, in terms of listening, uh, I learned some other things. Uh, so I learned that Josh thinks that we escaped to Canada on July the 4th because, as he said, well, it's not really his holiday anyway. <laughs> and we ran off to do our own thing. Hmm. <laughs> That's what I learned. I also learned something. I learned that uh, when James preaches at 
uh, the beginning of September, he's going to be taking a text from the Song of Solomon. Huh. A fitting denouement, uh, a wrap-up, if you will, to the marriage Sunday school class. Yeah, good luck keeping that thing PG. All right. <laughs> I'll be praying for you. I also learned uh, that Aaron's kids like to think of him as Thor. Not the strong, conquering Thor, but the depressed, disheveled, and distracted pot belly Thor. I may have added some words, Aaron. I'm not sure. That's my <laughs> paraphrase. Um, that Thor who's past his prime. Don't be too discouraged. I don't think my kids ever, ever thought of me as any kind of superhero. Anyway, the reality is you're north of 40, dude, so uh, <laughs> stuff just gets more difficult. The struggle is real, so hang in there, brother. <laughs> and if you want, you can join Davey and me tomorrow morning at Walnut Creek. We'll be running at 6.30. So. <laughs> anyway, you can learn a lot about someone from, from their words, what they think, what they value. Their words communicate those things. People's words greatly inform our opinions of them. But I think you know that we don't form our opinions about people in a complete vacuum. Our, our preconceptions often color much of what we conclude. Now, as we give our attention here to, to the Gospel of John, we see the reaction of people to Jesus' words. And whether it was the crowds that heard Jesus teaching, whether it was those temple guards who were sent to arrest Jesus, as we read in our text, or the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they all had, a, had formed an opinion about Jesus based on the things that he had said. And those opinions, of course, did not agree because they understood Jesus through the, the prism of their own preconceptions. But what stands out to me, at least in reading this text, is is the fact that when Jesus spoke, he could not be ignored. The officers who failed to arrest him gave their excuse. No one ever spoke like this man. This is so, so very true. No one ever spoke like Jesus. No one ever will speak like like Jesus. His voice is unique and it is impossible to ignore. Now, John included, of course, this event in the gospel because he wants to show us Christ. He, uh, the Holy Spirit, in fact, who inspired John, wants us to form our opinions of Jesus based on the truth that Jesus is the anointed Son of God. Jesus is the one who was from the beginning, who was in the beginning with God, who is indeed God, and that he came into the world for us to find eternal life in his name. Now, the setting of this, the section of scripture that we read is in the vicinity of the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus had been there teaching during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the setting. And so I, I want us to, to think on these things this morning, these thoughts as we try to gather up uh, some um, gather these thoughts around these ideas here. Uh, Jesus is this voice that you simply cannot ignore. And we're going to learn from unpacking this text that is his words bring division. Yes, his words bring division. You can't ignore Jesus' voice because his words have authority. And you cannot ignore Jesus' voice because his words make us alive. His words bring division, his words have authority, and his words make us alive. I think it was Lytton who said, the pen is mightier than the sword. The scriptures themselves, the book of James, talk about the words that we use, talking about the tongue being a fire, a world of unrighteousness, setting on fire the, the course of life. The political discourse currently. We see these epithets tossed around with little regard for reasoned communication. And, and as a result of words like this, the nation is divided. And for some, really especially, I think, younger people, words are even regarded as being acts of violence. I think we all understand the power of words to divide. I know this experientially. Uh, they've been very gracious. My family, of course, could probably recall some occasions, more than a few, where maybe my words have been arrogant or unkind. I may have related this story before, 
But once uh, Kathy and I were in the car, we were driving to get lunch together, and uh, I, had, I had been uh, spewing some opinions about something. I don't even remember what it was about, but I was becoming increasingly uh, arrogant and, and uh, trenchant in the way in which I was uh, arguing and, and, and uh, saying things. Being boisterous is not something that I always keep in check, especially with Kathy. She knows me well. Anyway, I was still pontificating as we entered the restaurant. As we walked in the door, I, just, I suddenly stopped and I said, I had to ask her, well, do you want a, a table or a booth? And she said, I don't know, wherever you and your high horse can fit. <laughs> uh, uh. Man, I was immediately amused, but also humbled. You see, I, in all my speaking, I had divided with my words. And we find Jesus' words creating division too. But unlike me, not because Jesus did or said anything wrong. Really, as a result of the things Jesus said, people were divided in their opinions. Just like the, the guard said, truly no one ever spoke like this man. People could not ignore him, and neither can we. Now, we look at our text here. There was talk. There was talk about Jesus. People knew that the religious leaders wanted to do away with Jesus. But the chatter among the the crowds, verse 40, some said that Jesus was really the prophet. The prophet, capital P, prophet. Who is that? Well, if... uh, Maybe you're familiar, maybe not, but this was the the promised Moses-like figure from Deuteronomy. You could look at Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him. It is to him you shall listen. So so they had this, this overtones, this messianic idea, this prophet. Others said that he is the Christ. That's verse 41. The Christ meaning anointed one. It was rightly understood to be that promised king who would come really as a final deliverer for Israel, the the one underneath or within the line of the covenant that God made with King David that there would forever, there would be a forever uh, occupant of his throne. That was the Messiah. Most, in fact, probably including Jesus' disciples, certainly at first thought that that Messiah figure would primarily be a political one, one who would wrest leadership back from from the Roman authorities and and become a self-governing kingdom under that Messiah. So some said that he was the prophet, some said that he was the Christ, and and now Christians post-resurrection, we see these two as different offices or roles of the same Christ person ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. But rabbinical teaching in that first century had them being separate people, perhaps the prophet preceding the Christ. Whatever the case was, people were divided. Others entirely rejected the idea that Jesus could be the Christ because they rightly understood that Messiah would be from Bethlehem, according to Micah 5.2. And they're thinking, well, he's from Nazareth. His family's from Nazareth. And in fact, Nazareth being in Galilee, Galileans were absolutely despised by the elite in Jerusalem. They couldn't stand them. They looked down their noses on Galileans. No prophet would come from Galilee. Forgetting about Jonah, but no prophet, they would say. Certainly, the Christ would not come from there. Of course, John feels no compelling reason to correct the record, knowing that Jesus indeed was born in Bethlehem according to the Scriptures. But all that aside... There's all of this disagreement. The people had differing views. Those differing views, of course, to those people had serious implications. It wasn't like the difference of opinion that people have about what's your favorite sports team or or musical group. It was far more profound. The depth of division would maybe not be unlike the way that things are today and the political discourse, following one party versus another, because it all relates to questions about where our future is going to be, what it's going to look like when, when this or that person leads. The fact that Jesus' words brought division, as I said, is of course not owing to anything wrong in his part. 
The vision was caused by the fact that when exposed to the light of truth, those who delight in evil ultimately reject the truth and they reject Jesus' words as a result. Hearts that have been darkened by sin, those kinds of hearts are repulsed by the light of the truth of Jesus. This is what Jesus, or back in chapter 3, Jesus explaining this to Nicodemus. He says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. I wonder, I wonder, do Jesus' words offend you? Now you may be thinking, well, the, the red letter stuff? No. The whole of the scripture could be rightly attributed to Jesus, who is the very word of God. Being the living word of God, any of the least punctuation or the longest paragraph or the most descriptive or, or just simply stated thing, all of it, Jesus would own and say, yes, I agree. Perhaps the Bible offends you that it says, if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. Does the Bible offend you that it says that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Does it offend you that, that the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, those who practice homosexuality, the grieves, the thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Does it offend you that unless you repent of your sin before the Lord, you will perish? See, the fact is that Jesus' words divide because they set him, they prove him, they show him to be against the world. And Jesus' words set any who would truly believe in him against the world. And maybe, maybe even against people that we love. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And I know some here have experienced this because you stand with Jesus. You stand against the world. Some right now feel that division, feel that Jesus' words have separated you from people you love, people that love you, a sister, a mother, a father, a son, or a daughter. And while they say they love you and they do love you, they hate that you have a higher allegiance to Jesus. I understand it's a heartbreaking reality that That just has to cause you to pray more fervently. You see, Jesus means, he means to divide with his words. He intends to. And at the most fundamental level, he wants to divide you from the grip that sin has on your life. That's good. When you put your faith in Jesus, He'll separate you from the eternal consequence of your sin. You should want that. His words will point you to the cross. He's calling you. He's calling you. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Indeed, no one ever spoke like this man. You cannot ignore him. Jesus' words divide. Second, Jesus' words have authority. Now, if you've ever been on the, uh, the Illinois Tollway, and I'd say this, without a transponder and, and without enough cash, you know how expensive it can be. Uh, we were traveling there, this is last year, more than a year ago. We were there for Jacob's graduation from 
Navy basic training. Now, if you miss a toll, here's how it works. And there are a lot of them around Chicago. Some of you know this. Now, you're not supposed to stop. You're supposed to note where you are. <laughs> now, try that in busy traffic when you're trying to figure out when your next exit is. But you're supposed to note. I guess you're supposed to write it down. I'm not sure. But you're supposed to know where you are. And then you're supposed to go online within seven days and pay the toll for the one you missed. There are hundreds of them. Good luck. Now, how do I know this? Well, I received a bill in the mail. And uh, part, of, part of what they do is if you miss that toll, $1.25, when you get the bill, it's $21.25. So an extra 20 bucks for just missing the deadline. Now, why, why do I know this? <laughs> well, I got that bill. And so what I'm explaining to you here is that there is an authority that you come under for going on the Illinois tollway. And I know that because I looked on the website. There was no way of getting out of this fine, and I had to pay an exorbitant fine for missing my tolls. But they have words that say they have the authority to collect. And if you don't pay, I think they can come and get your car. <laughs> words have authority. We get that. Now, there's an infinitely greater Authority, of course, attached to Jesus' words. Jesus' words have authority over everything and everyone. No one ever spoke like this man. You cannot ignore him. Now, in my studies this, this past week, I don't normally quote from commentaries, but this one explanation for that interchange between those guards who failed to arrest Jesus, going back to the Pharisees. He, he kind of imagines how this went down. This is G. Campbell Morgan. No, we did not arrest him. He arrested us. We laid no hands on him, but he laid on us the superlative spell of his speech. You see, the way Jesus spoke was arresting. Why? Because his words have authority, supreme authority. Earlier in this chapter, others had marveled at Jesus' words. Seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 15. How is it that this man has learning? He's never studied. And what is it that Jesus did say that was so poignant and so focused and so otherworldly, if you will? 728. I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. You see, Jesus said that he was sent by the Father. The authority of his own words that he spoke was, was carried authority from God the Father. 733, he said, I'll be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me, declaring the unfolding of future history. Jesus made it clear that he decided when that would be. Verse 37 of chapter 7, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, declaring himself to be the fulfillment, really, of that, that messianic hope that was all wrapped up in that Feast of Tabernacles. Why is it that Jesus' words have authority? Well, I've said it, but because it is because he is the word of God. That's what John 1, 1 says. You see, nothing at all exists apart from the word of Christ. Nothing. He spoke. The sun appeared. There were planets. There were solar systems. He spoke, and this earth was populated with plants, and it produced life. He spoke and there were animals. He spoke and there were a man and a woman on the earth. He spoke. And so when, when Jesus says anything at all, he speaks with the same authority that he spoke when he called the very creation into existence. So of course, of course when people heard him, the crowds, as it says in Matthew 7, 28, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. You see, they'd heard a lot of religious talk. They'd heard the teaching from the scribes and Pharisees, but it had no real substance to it. But when they heard Jesus' voice, they heard his authority. And even if they didn't fully understand it, Jesus himself explained the unity of his own words with that of the Father. He says, my teaching it's not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, 
He will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. You see, Jesus' words had all of the authority of God the Father, this perfect unity as the Son of the Father, carried all of the weight of all of the scriptures every time he opened his mouth. I'm wondering, do you find Jesus' words to be arresting? Do you find them to be authoritative. I I wonder what your attitude is. And remember, all of the scriptures can rightly be said as the word of Christ. When you read the scriptures, do you do so with, with a humble and submitted heart? Or, and I have to confess this, there are times in my Bible reading, I look at it as something to get through. <laughs> That's not a good use of the scriptures. You come to it humbly, expecting to submit to what you read? Or do you stand over it and evaluate its worth in the moment? When you hear the word preach, do you come expecting to humble yourself under that word? Or do you stand over it, evaluating whether or not the presentation is pleasing to you? And I think you know this, and we, we say this enough around here. The task of the preacher is is not to stand up here on his own authority. I have nothing, nothing at all to say to you apart from what this book says. So I'm not asking you to listen to me. I'm asking you to submit to God. Jesus' words have authority over this church. This was reviewed this morning in the Evangelism Sunday School class. Matthew 28, Jesus says, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. All authority. He commands us to make disciples. Jesus' words have authority about how we should think about our own lives. What we do with our time. What we do with our stuff. What you do with your body, all of it, Jesus has authority over. Jesus has authority over how you should think about other people. Jesus said very clearly, love one another. And then he gave his own self as an example. As I have loved you, so, that is to say, in this way, you are to love one another. But listen, the best news of all, or maybe wrapped up in all of this, is that Jesus has authority to forgive your sin. Some of you have come here this morning feeling the extraordinary weight of guilt. You know you stand before a holy God and and you feel dirty, and rightly so. We all feel that way because of our sin. But Jesus takes authority over that sin. And he took authority over it by going to the cross. He took upon himself every vile deed. If you've put your trust in him, if you put your trust in Jesus, Jesus took to the cross every vile deed and thought. And he paid with his own blood so that you could be forgiven. What a glorious, glorious use of his authority. And for those who know that forgiveness this morning, we are grateful for Jesus' authority. Are we not? Well, you know he has authority because his words have authority. This message that came to our ears and implanted itself in our hearts, this good news about Jesus, what he came to do, who he is as the son of God, the fact that he died in our place on the cross and the fact that he rose again on that that third day, that good news has authority to save other people too. And so when we're in conversations with people, we don't have to be thinking, what might I say to get them saved? No, it is the gospel that alone is God's power for the salvation of people. 
Well, the right way to respond to authority is to humble yourself. No one ever spoke like Jesus. His words are authoritative. You can't ignore, ignore him, so don't, don't ignore him. Well, finally, Jesus' words make us alive. Jesus' words make us alive. I, at a funeral, funerals I often say, life is a mystery. It's, it is. It's true. It's because in the midst of grief, we find ourselves reaching for answers, right? One moment, one moment, this one we loved was alive. And then in another moment, she was not. So whatever it was, tragic accident or disease, life is taken away without our consent. Now, we can try to preserve it through medicine. We can try to preserve it through wise decisions. But ultimately, it is not ours to give. And that's a mystery to us. Only God holds those keys. Jesus holds those keys. Truly, no one ever spoke like this man. You can't ignore him. Now, I want to I wanna think... I want to think for a moment of what, what this passage tells us because we're introduced again to this man named Nicodemus. Verse 50, Nicodemus, who had gone, on, gone to him before, that is Jesus, and who was one of them, that is the Pharisees, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. This is the second of three occasions where we meet Nicodemus in the scriptures. That first uh, referred here is when he came to, to Jesus at night because he had these questions and he concluded that no can, nobody can do these signs unless he's from God. And Jesus told him at that moment, unless one is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. That third occasion where Nicodemus shows up again is at the end of the gospel. He is part of that uh, he, he, he takes Jesus' body and he prepares it for burial. A very risky and, and devoted act, which, which to me seems like he had embraced Jesus for the Savior that he is and the divine Son of God that he is. Now, at this point, we really don't know Nicodemus' heart, but, but his willingness to, to suffer the derision of the rest of these Pharisees and even suggesting that Jesus be given a fair hearing from that council, I, I think that suggests to me at least that faith is beginning to be awakened in him. Now, how would that happen? How would that faith be awakened in Nicodemus? Remember, it's John's objective in writing this gospel to tell us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He wants us to know that. And that by believing, by faith in him, we would have eternal life in his name. And we, brothers and sisters in Christ, we believe this morning because Jesus has spoken. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The way John introduced Jesus at the beginning of the gospel, in him was life and the life was the light of men. And that life is, is not just for these bodies, but in fact, it's a spiritual, eternal existence with a new body in the presence of God as his children. John says at the beginning of this gospel, all who did receive him, that is Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And on that occasion where Jesus met that Samaritan woman by the well, he offered her, he said, whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And Jesus' disciples had spent enough time with him by the last chapter, chapter six, when, when so many people were turning away because they did not satisfy their Jesus did not satisfy their desire to have a miracle worker be a king among them. He said, are you going to go too? Jesus' disciples got it. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You can't ignore Jesus' words. Jesus' words bring life. And apart from Jesus' words, we would all be dead in our sins. And apart from Jesus' words, we would all be destined for eternal separation from God in hell. So don't be like the crowds who had formed their own opinions about Jesus without taking his words to heart. Don't be like the Pharisees who, who wanted to kill Jesus because they hated his words. 
Indeed, no one ever spoke like this man, and you can't ignore him. So please, if you have not done so, come to Jesus in faith. And if you have come to Jesus in faith, delight in his words. Yes, he's going to divide you from your sin, and he will divide you from the world, and you will come under the authority of everything that he has to say, and you will conform. You will find that you want to conform to the things that he says. And we can be reminded every time we open the scriptures that because Jesus has spoken, we are indeed now alive. No one ever spoke like this man. He will wield the sword of his word. And I'll remind you, he will divide you from the ways of the world. And he has divided you from the consequence of your sin. So delight In the word of Jesus, he is the voice you can ignore. Let's not ignore him. Well, let's pray together as we prepare to receive at the Lord's table. Father in heaven, we who belong to the Lord Jesus, we who have put our faith in him, have been invited by him to take these elements to hand and to mouth, And to be reminded of the the very gospel truth that he alone is Savior. That he alone has the words of eternal life. That his words point to his own actions at the cross of receiving there the full punishment for our sin. Satisfying eternally, Father, your righteous judgment against that sin. So, Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his cross. And we thank you for this opportunity to be reminded among his people of all that he has accomplished for us. So we pray by your Holy Spirit that you'd be present here and confirm the gospel truths to our minds and in our hearts. Even now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.